Let us look at some other aspects of Kel of the poem, Celtic Druidism and other pagan traditions. There is no denying that Coleridge sprinkled lots of spooky stuff into the poem, <clears throat> but very little of it is random or solely atmospheric. The first part in particular is packed with very specific symbols from pagan religions and other mystical traditions. Coleridge lived in a time with a strong sense of superstition than we have now. So many of these symbols would have been a lot more obvious to his audience. However, some of these are classics and we can pick them up, pick them out easily even today. Most of these appear in the first half of the poem before Geraldine was able to work her spells inside the castle, which helps us understand who or what Geraldine might be underneath all that pretty illusion. Line 29 The forest is a sacred place in many pagan religions, especially in Druidism. The meaning of Druidism, you can look it up. Druids really dig trees. In fact, they believe that the forest is a temple. Now, why would Christabel, a character who appears to be Catholic in the stro story, choose to pray in a manner more befitting a druid? It seems that this is Coleridge's way of exposing Christabel's innocence and naivety early in the on in the poem. In her effort to not disturb her father, who does not sleep well, she goes outside to pray instead. Unfortunately though, <clears throat> she intends to engage in a pious and Christian act, she inadvertently engages in a pagan one instead because she does not know any better. Worse yet, by doing this inadvertently or not, she makes herself even more vulnerable than usual to the pagan or evils that lurk in the woods. Lines 33-34 These lines specifically tell us that the tree Christabel is praying under is oak and that there is a mistletoe on it. No big deal, right? Well, actually, it is a kind of big deal for druids who believed that both the oak and mistletoe were sacred. Mistletoe, being a parasitic plant, appeared to grow without any roots or other connection to the earth. If a plant does not have a connection to the ground, then, logically, it must have connections to the heavens instead, making mistletoe a highly sacred plant. They also believed that these plants took on the qualities of the plants they grow on. And so, the mixture of the holy oak and the sacred mistletoe together makes for a really powerful place. It is important to note that pagans would feel that this area would be quite safe. But Coleridge paints a picture of just the opposite, which tells us what he thinks of the pagan belief. Line 30, belief system, sorry. Line 35. Coleridge is not being subtle here. He wants us to remember that this is not just any tree, but an oak tree, complete with all its pagan and spooky symbolism. Line 42. Now it's not just an old oak tree, it's a huge broad-breasted one. This will not be the first time Coleridge mentions breasts in this poem. In fact, this may be a bit of foreshadowing of what is to come later on in Christabel's bedroom. Line 63 Geraldine's bare feet connect her directly to the earth. We are pretty sure hip romantics refer to feet as druid sandals. Okay, maybe not, but it sounds good. Numbers as symbols. In several places, Coleridge provides a very specific number for things. By now we know he is such a sly dog that he would never give us such a specific description 
without meaning something by it. Though a couple are more folklore related, most of the numbers are religious symbols of some sort. That is no surprise, considering that symbolic numbers pop up quite a bit in just about every religious tradition in history. Line 10. The numbers here tell us that it is midnight. The poem opens right at the start of the witching hour, that hour of the night where the veil between the world of the living and the world of the spirits is thinnest, and when the witches and other spooky folks have the most power. This is yet another neon warning sign that something bad is about to happen. Line 12 We already know that it is midnight and that the dog howls once each quarter hour plus 12 times for the hour, just like the clock tower. Seems simple enough, right? Well, maybe not. Just as Coleridge gives us a little math lesson to remind us that 12 plus 4 is 16, he drops the bomb that there is a ghost hanging out with the dog. Reading forward a little, we understand that this ghost is Christabel's mother. Placing the number and the appearance of Christabel's mother so close together, especially when her sudden appearance seems like a total non-sequitur, makes us feel like the speaker is trying to tell us something. In the Bible, the number 16 shows up as a symbol of God's never-ending love. Here, it may symbolize a mother's never-ending love and protection for her child, even after that mother is dead. Line 49 the number one is singular, of course, but it is also contained in everything else. We cannot have two sandwiches without having one to start with. Here the one leaf represents the presence of two opposing forces within, within one thing, spring and winter, life and death, good and evil. It is telling us that within us of all three exist, there exists the potential for both good and evil. Hey, it looks like one isn't so lonely after all. Line 81. In Christianity, the number five represents God's grace. In some folklore, it is only a pack of five men on white horses who can hope to catch a vampire. Again, this gives us a pretty big hint about Geraldine's true nature. Line 201. Bells are a traditional part of a wedding day. So talking about bells being rung on that day is no big deal. However, Christabel specifically says that all the bells will be rung 12 times on her wedding day, which could be considered in a couple of different ways. First, as a Christian symbol, the number 12 is supposed to be a sacred number. It symbolizes God's power and authority. Ring, ringing the bells 12 times on a wedding day would be a blessing for the couple, letting them know that their bond has been made with the authority of God. That would probably make Christabel's mom happy, even in the afterlife. What probably won't make Christabel's mom happy is that it's possible that Coleridge intended for us to understand that Christabel is already married to Geraldine. Remember the beginning of the poem when the narrator tells us the bells rang 12 times to mark midnight? Christabel's mother was there to hear them too, if the dog really is seeing her ghost. To add to this weirdness, Christabel even carries her bride over the shoulder of over the threshold of the castle in lines 131-132. It is not a literal marriage, of course, but it does appear that, literal or not, the couple consummates that marriage that night as well. In other words, they indulge in some sexual activity. Christabel's mother does not show up again as a ghost after she is shooed away by Geraldine in the room that contained their wedding bed. 
It is layers like this that make this poem so interesting and very likely explains why Coleridge worked so hard on it yet never finished it. This level of complexity is hard work. Line 305 One single hour is all Geraldine needed to completely corrupt poor Christabel. Specifically, that one hour was the witching hour, so that probably helped make the job easier. Themes in Christabel by S.T. Coleridge The theme of good versus evil The theme of good versus evil shows us in the most classic way in Christabel. Shows up, sorry. Allusions to Christ's struggle with Satan himself. Coleridge makes it clear that Christabel is as pure as a baby unicorn before she finds a creepy lady in the woods. And if that is not enough to, con to convince you that Christabel has been cast as the good guy, then the fact that Christ is the first part of her name ought to do the trick. Geraldine, on the other hand, has the eyes of a snake and hisses at Christabel in each of the two parts of the poem. The fact is that Geraldine is not actually evil at all. She is simply possessed by an evil spirit that is directing her to commit these sins against poor Christabel and her father. Coleridge can't seem to make up his mind when it comes to his description of Geraldine. But this may be an intentional choice to obscure her true nature. The Supernatural Theme Christabel is chock full of spooky stuff, from witches to ghosts to prophetic dreams. The bulk of the supernatural elements are recognizable bits of folklore and superstition with which the romantic poets like Coleridge loved to use as part of their stories. The intention of all the weirdness is to keep the reader feeling a bit off-kilter. In fact, reading the poem is a bit like walking through a carnival funhouse. Unfortunately, this carnival funhouse does not have an end, so we just keep bumping into ourselves in funky mirrors and never really get our bearings again. This may very well be why Coleridge never finishes Finish this poem, especially since so much of the inspiration for the poem came from his own psychological struggles. Coleridge borrows heavily from folklore and superstitions to drop major hints about Geraldine's true identity. The overall weirdness of Christabel reflects Coleridge's own paranoia and superstitious nature. The theme of memory and the past. What happened in the past plays a prominent role in the world of Christabel. There are constant reminders of Christabel's dead mother. In fact, the castle bells are rung every single morning just in case someone managed to forget about her in the span of 24 hours. It's almost as if someone or something is trying to prevent the development of new memories forcing everyone to relive the misery of the past at the expense of creating any new happiness in the present. It sounds like a real blast. Coleridge Sir Leoline's extended mourning of his wife's death creates a major ob obstacle in the development of his relationship with his daughter. Eventually, the townsfolk around Sir Leoline's castle are going to lose their patience with the constant tolling of morning bells. They will likely leave or overthrow his rule over their lands because they, and rightly, believe him to be psychologically unfit to boss them around. Compassion and Forgiveness Compassion and forgiveness are usually good things. But in Christabel, these positive attributes do nothing but get people into trouble. Bad guys are really good at taking advantage of qualities that aren't normally seen as weaknesses. 
Geraldine takes advantage of both Christabel's compassion for a damsel in distress and Sir Leoline's desire to forgive his old friend. We are talking about the father of Geraldine. Of course, we don't know how this will ultimately play out in the end. But it sure does look good at the beginning. That will teach them to care about others. The poem shows us the hidden dangers of caring for strangers. There is nothing noble about Christabel's compassion. In fact, it is less compassion than an extreme case of na naivety, means uh, foolishness. Women and femininity, theme of women and femininity. Coleridge had a rough life and at the time he knew a lot of women he could blame for that. His family background and the relationships he developed as an adult led him to be exceptionally sensitive to and interested in the struggles of women. Some scholars feel that Christabel is particularly insightful on a few different aspects of the feminine experience. Not only does he explore blossoming sexual urges in young women through Christabel's encounter with Geraldine, but he also considers her role as a motherless daughter and an estranged companion once her father turns his back on her. Coleridge's views on women seems to include a general lack of self-control when it comes to sexual urges. Though both are women, Christabel represents the ultra-feminine while Geraldine represents the masculine. The theme of mysticism which is prominent in one of Coleridge's most fantastical poems, Kobla Khan, is also prominent in Christabel. Geraldine is overtaken by a mysterious spell several times during the poem. And near the end of the poem, she somehow transfers the effects of the spell to Christabel. Once Christabel physically recovers from the spell, she still seems transformed. Christabel's kindness and consideration for Geraldine have disappeared and she begs her father to cast Geraldine out of their home. This is uh, dealt with in part two of the poem. Christabel goes from selfless to selfish. The ways in which the spells taint or spoil Geraldine and Christabel suggest the destructive powers of mysticism. In the essay, Coleridge's Christabel and the Phantom Soul, Anya Taylor claims that the poem is, and to quote Anya Taylor, part of Coleridge's lifelong meditation on the vulnerabilities of will and agency. Um, on page 708, the two young female characters in Christabel are certainly vulnerable to the overwhelming powers of the supernatural world. The theme of the power of nature, which is present in much of Coleridge's work, also appears in Christabel. For example, Sir Leoline's Mastiff immediately senses the evil and danger that Geraldine brings. The Mastiff, which means dog, it's a type breed of dog, Mastiff, howls when she senses that Christabel, Christabel is near Geraldine in the woods. The dog angrily moans when Geraldine passes by in Sir Leoline's home. The animal's sixth sense suggests the power of the natural world. Lesbianism, that is the theme of lesbianism. One aspect of the poem Christabel that a modern reader must attend to is the question of what happens in Christabel's chamber. Coleridge leaves the details unspecified at the time of this poem. Sorry, unspecified. At the time of this poem, writing about lesbians was taboo. The most well-known instance of this topic is the case of the French poet Charles Baudelaire who has, was prosecuted in 1857 for the so-called indecency of several of his poems, including ones featuring lesbians. 
Coleridge skirts the edge of this topic both by making Geraldine seemingly a supernatural creature, repeatedly reiterating her innocence and status as a maiden to Christabel, and not specifying the activities of the night in question. That is what happens that night in Christabel's bedroom is not clearly described. What is clear is that Geraldine directs the younger woman to disrobe and then does so for herself. Further, Christabel, on her elbow, did recline to look at the Lady Geraldine. As Christabel watches, Geraldine disrobes by lamplight. After her clothing drops to her feet, her bosom and half her side are depicted as a sight to dream of, not to tell. <clears throat> not to tell means not to speak about. Geraldine then joins Christabel and in her arms the maid she took, that is, she hugs Christabel by folding her in her arms. She tells Christabel that she has cast a spell. In the touch of this bosom there worketh a spell which is the lord of thy utterance. Christabel will remember the night but be unable to speak of it. That night with Gerard Christabel will be the mark of my shame, the seal of my sorrow. In the conclusion to part one, in the conclusion to part one, the speaker notes that Geraldine holds the maiden in her arms. Furthermore, Christabel cries in her sleep and yet seems to smile as infants at a sudden light. The two women are in an embrace as they sleep, and Christabel is both smiling and crying. The reference to a sudden light seems like an epiphany, that is a sudden um, lucky happening in your life. The evidence continues with Christabel's words when she wakes, which are, sure I have sinned. She also notes how beautiful Geraldine is. Christabel Part 1 Analysis Thematically, the poem is one of Coleridge's most cohesive constructs, with the narrative plot more explicit than previous works such as the fragmented Kubla Khan, which tend to transcend trans traditional composure. Indeed, in many respects, the consistency of the poem, most apparent from the structural formality and rhythmic rigidity, four accentual beats to every line, when regarded alongside the unyielding mysticism of the account, creates the greatest juxtaposition in the poem. Parenthetically, Coleridge describes such mysticism and vagueness in his notes to the rhyme of the ancient marin man mariner as mesmeric in an attempt to justify his conventional ideas of being profound in their stark originality. While some modern critics focus upon lesbian and feminist readings of the poem, another interesting interpretation is the one that explores the demonic presence that underscores much of the action. Geraldine, who initially appears to be an almost mirror image of Christabel, is later revealed as being far more complex, both sexually and morally. And to quote from the text, like one that shuddered she unbound the cincture from beneath her breast, her silken robe and inner vest dropped to her feet, and in full view behold her bosom and half her side. Uh, these are lines 248 to 252 of the poem. Christabel revolves around the juxtaposition of sin and evil versus religiosity and devoutness and sexuality versus purity. The obvious characters who represent these juxtapositions are Christabel, who represents devoutness and purity, and Geraldine who represents sin, evil and sexuality. Christabel frequently prays throughout the poem. 
and one of the most prominent furnishings in her bedroom <clears throat> is the carving of an angel it's more of a statue actually in addition Christabel is patiently waiting for and could be seen as saving herself for her betrothed knight in contrast Geraldine claims <clears throat> that she does not have the strength to praise the virgin mary for being rescued by Christabel Geraldine likewise represents sin and a lack of devoutness through her serpent like looks and her hissing noises this behavior alludes to means refer, refers to the snake that tempts eve in the garden of eden this is a story of the bible the story of adam and eve living in the garden of eden in addition geraldine has been roughly handled by five strange men and she often exhibits shame and a sense of impurity when she is around christabel christabel's rescuing of geraldine can be read as a pure woman saving a fallen woman although geraldine is constructed to be Christ christabel's foil means the exact opposite so that her impurities can enhance the sense of christabel's goodness and purity Geraldine herself interestingly embodies the aforementioned juxtapositions juxtaposition basically means bringing two opposites parallel to one another for instance although geraldine symbolizes impurity and evil she wears a beautiful white robe that embody that symbolizes purity furthermore the scene that exemplifies geraldine's embodiment of these juxtaposing qualities is the one in which she is praying by christabel's bed in the middle of her prayer geraldine is overcome by the orgasm like gestures of her eyes rolling around the drawing in of her breath the shivering of her body and her sudden unclasping of her belt to remove half of her white robe this sin and sexuality overtake devoutness and purity it is the middle of the night by the castle clock and the owls have awakened the crowing cock to wit to woo and hark again the crowing cock how drowsily it crew this first stanza of the poem christabel projects on her our minds the image of a medieval english castle <clears throat> the details of the castle are scattered all over the poem on the basis of these details we can describe it as a woodland castle that is the castle is built in the middle of a wood and here the word woodland means jungle the wood sta stands at a stands at a distance of about a furlong from the castle gate The castle is surrounded by a moat presumably spanned by a small bridge. In the present poem the poet has represented the medievalism of the English people on a grand scale. Here we have poetic visions of medieval English civilization, English culture and English superstitions etc. So describing the castle the poet says that the castle clock was striking 12. the midnight hour it wakes up the owl which hoot to wit to hoot the voice of the owl says hooting wakes the cock the owl's hooting the speaker says the owl's hooting wakes the cock and presently it crows very drowsily thus the very first line of the poem is full of action and create suspense to make the readers aware that this is really going to be a great poem sir leoline the baron rich hath a toothless mastiff bitch from her kennel beneath the rock she make it answer to the clock four for the quarters and 12 for the hour ever and i by shine and shower 
16 short howls, not over loud. Some say she sees my lady's shroud. From lines 6 to 16, the poet informs us that the castle owner, the rich baron, has a toothless mastiff bitch. She lies in her kennel beneath the rock. When the clock strikes, strikes a quarter after 11 p.m., she howls 12 times. Whether it is rainy or moonlit, she always makes 16 howls from 11 to 12, which are short and moderately loud. The poet further says that people of the castle say that at the time she perceives Lady Leoline's ghost that keeps wandering here and there in the castle. As we know that Coleridge is well known for creating supernatural elements through his poem, and this very quality of the poet is best depicted when he talks about the howling of the she-bitch that gives an answer to the clocks each strikes. Is the night chilly and dark? The night is chilly but not dark. The thin grey cloud is spread on high. It covers but not hides the sky. The moon is behind and at the full, and yet she looks both small and dull. The night is chill, the cloud is grey. Tis a month before the month of May, and the spring comes slowly up this way. As we move ahead with the poem, the suspense becomes deeper. Though as of now, the poem is presented to in terms of a suspense story, as we read on, it becomes clear the, there is something to be served to us in terms of something unique. In these lines, the poet asks and answers himself when he says, Is the night very cold and dark? The night is very cold indeed, but not dark. The sky is covered with a layer of thin grey clouds. It is not hidden by the clouds. So although the moon is behind them, yet it is visible as the full moon. Yet it looks both small and dull. The night is very cold. The clouds are grey. The poet says it is April and the spring is gradually showing itself in this region. The lovely Lady Christabel, whom her father loves so well, what makes her in the wood so late, a furlong from the castle gate? She had dreams all yesternight of her own betrothed knight, and she in the midnight wood will pray for the wheel of her lover that's far away. Here we come in front of the lead character of this poem. Describing her, the poet says, Christabel is a lovely young lady. Her father, Sir Leoline, loves her very well. But what brings her at midnight into the wood about a furlong from the castle gate? The poet further says, She had dreamt of her lover night all the while she was asleep last night. So she has come into the wood at midnight in order to pray for the well-being of her lover who is far away in a distant land. Let me tell you here that the introduction of the main character of the poem, named Christabel, is brought to us all of a sudden. And in the following, the poet says, She stole along, she nothing spoke, she sighs, she heaved, was the sighs she heaved was soft and low, and not was green upon the oak, but moss and rarest mistletoe. She kneels beneath the huge oak, oak tree, and in silence prayeth she. She walks stealthily and silently into the forest. She also breathes softly and lowly. On the oak tree there is nothing green except the moss and the mistletoe, a parasitic plant which grows rarely on the oak. The poet further says, having arrived beneath the huge oak tree, she kneels and prays silently. In the above, the poet has made us familiar with Christabel, but there is yet to be revealed more. The lady sprang up suddenly, the lovely lady Christabel. It moaned as near as near can be, what, but what it is she cannot tell. On the other side it seems to be of the huge-breasted old oak tree. These lines are also replete with surprising elements. And in these lines also, we come across surprise and suspense. 
as the poet himself says that suddenly the lovely lady christabel springs up hearing a low sound of pain very close to her but the poet says she does not understand what it is it came to her from the other side of the huge broad old oak tree the night is chill the forest bare is it the wind that moaneth bleak there is not wind enough in the air to move away the ringlet curl from the lovely lady's cheek through the above lines the poet is describing about the surrounding and he says that the night is cold the forest trees are leafless she that is christabel asks herself whether it is the cold and cheerless wind which made the moan but to her surprise the poet tells there is not wind enough to wave the curl of her hair lying on her lovely cheek with this we end looking at the analysis of the poem christabel by samuel taylor coleridge which is prescribed for the students of ba part 2 english literature in paper 1 thank you